In the last installment of Legend of the Force, we look at, looked at the novel series that featured Han Solo. This time, we are looking at the portion of Marvel's Star Wars where Han's was pretty much absent, the part in between the release of The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Unfortunately, documentation of what was going on inside Marvel at this time and what led to the decisions that were made on the Star Wars books is not readily available. Marvel Comics, The Untold Story, the definitive work on the inner workings of Marvel Comics, generally brushes over their licensed titles at this time. And boy, there were a bunch of licensed titles that came out from Marvel at this era. Marvel also, at a time, had the rights to put out Star Trek comics com parallel with when they had the rights to Star Wars comics, and these included an adaptation of Star Trek The Motion Picture. They also took on a slew of other licensed comics, a span that would continue into the 80s and would lead to the Transformers, G.I. Joe, and Godzilla licensed comics. Star Wars remained first among all of these, in many cases outselling much of Marvel's own work as well. However, while Star Wars retained its cultural cachet, I don't think everyone expected to be as blown away as they were when Empire Strikes Back came out. Empire was a film that... As this recording, it is generally considered not only to be the best film of the franchise as a whole, but also among the top films in the history of cinema. So what Marvel did after Empire is somewhat interesting. The creative lineup on the book shifted, from long-established creators like Ray Thomas and Archie Goodwin, to up-and-comers like Chris Claremont, Walter Simonson, David Michelini, and Mary Jo Duffy. All of these writers and artists would go on to other books in the main Marvel Universe and leave their indelible mark on Marvel Comics as a whole. In the case of Claremont, his run at X-Men is quite possibly the longest run that any writer has had on a comic book that they did not themselves create, and he introduced a massive number of characters to the Marvel Universe. And it's reasonable to say that his take on the characters defined how the X-Men have been viewed by other writers and readers for over 30 years. In the case of Walter Simonson, in addition to dramatically contributing to that X-Men run and drawing Louise Simonson's classic X-Factor run, he would go on to write and draw a run of Thor that also pretty much defined the popular view of that character, telling some stories which are epic in pretty much every stretch of the word. And as for David Michelini, aside from his time at DC, David shaped Iron Man as a character to a tremendous extent, writing the Armor Wars and Demon in a Bottle storylines, along with introducing Justin Hammer and James Rhodes. His run on Spider-Man would introduce Venom, and his run on the Avengers would introduce... Um, Ant-Man number two, Scott Lang, and Taskmaster. That's three major MCU characters, two of them Avengers, created by Michelin. That's a hard record for other Marvel writers who aren't Stan Lee to beat. Mary Jo Duffy's track record, on the other hand, would be more pronounced as an editor than a writer. After writing the Fallen Angels miniseries for Marvel, she would go on to edit Marvel's release of Katsuhiro Ultimo's magnum opus Akira, probably one of the first major manga releases in the United States, and the first manga release from a major comics publisher. Mm -hmm. 
While A New Hope tied up all the major plot points into a pretty neat bow, Empire Strikes Back, being a cliffhanger, left some hooks open to writers and build on while they were bridging the gaps between the next two films. The first is the search for a new base for the Rebel Alliance, and with it a search for more allies. This in turn leads to the introduction of a slightly psychic alien race called the Hujib. The Hujib could be compared to the Fuzzies from H. Beam Piper's novel Little Fuzzy, which is contemporaneous with Lensman and Flash Gordon, making it a nice fit with the Star Wars universe. After the Alliance and the Hujib come to an arrangement, the Alliance uses the Hujib's homeworld as a base for the remainder of this run of the comic. As the end of Empire introduced the Alliance fleet, we get several stories related to that as well. From an issue focused on R2-D2 and C-3PO that relates to an Alliance attempt to hide the fleet from the eyes of the Empire in a son's corona. This part of the plot also leads to Luke and the group being sent on a bunch of diplomatic missions while attempting to find allies, which takes us to the aquatic world of La Spain, where Luke in turn meets a young man named Kuro. The storyline leaves La Spain decimated by an Imperial super weapon, but we'll return to that world later. We'll also introduce to another race that will play a significant role in the book to come, the Zeltran. The Zeltran are a species that I'd almost compare to Starfire's race from DC Comics, where they feel emotions very strongly, and also land, tend toward the very attractive and somewhat promiscuous, or as promiscuous, promiscuous as you can get under the comics code and with the Star Wars license. Were it not for the fact that the race was created by Mary Jo Duffy, I assume this was the sort of thing that was created by a writer who wants an opportunity for cheesecake. But no, this sets up a big narrative deal that comes up after Return of the Jedi. The second major plot thread is related to Luke's hunt for his son. This plot thread is brought to the fore with the introduction of the character of Sharia Bray, a rebel pilot who Luke falls for and who briefly leads to an awkward love triangle with Leia before Bray is presumed to be killed in a friendly fire incident with Luke as they are attacking an Imperial base. It's revealed that Sharia Bray was a actually an a Imperial Deep Cover agent sent to discredit Luke and get him driven from the Alliance so Luke Vader can pick him up. However, this is not the last we'll hear of Sharia Bray. Finally, there is a search for Boba Fett and Han Solo. This search tends to get pushed to the rear by all the other plot threads in part because, well, that's the plot thread that cannot be resolved at all until the next film, and the writers can't set up the resolution until they know where the next film is going. Now, the release of Shadows of the Empire in the 90s, contemporaneous with the release of the Star Wars Special Edition, will lead to much of this era being retconned from existence. However, events of this comics run do light a fuse that will take almost 24 years to detonate. Han Solo is currently in Carbonite and is thus generally chilling out. Princess Leia is in a somewhat conflicted situation. On the one hand, she deeply loves Han and wants to get him back. On the other hand, she is confused about this connection she has with Luke that she doesn't quite understand yet. Luke spends his time in between the films running missions for the Alliance and helping look for Han, and he doesn't get to do the louder as much as he'd like. The primary narrative arc in this period is the romance with Sharia Bray, along with the development of his Jedi abilities over the course of this block. Luke is not as hot-headed as he was in the last chunk, but he still occasionally calls upon his anger and uses that to fuel his Force usage. However, the dividing line between the light and dark sides of the Force doesn't really come up that much, which is unfortunate, because this is something that Luke should be grappling with, particularly since this conflict, the conflict between the light and dark sides, is as much a part of the climax of Return of the Jedi as the actual fight with Vader is. Wedge gets a filler issue explaining what he's been up to since Hoth, which will pretty much be retconned from existence. Lando gets more character development in this run of the comics than he does in almost any other portion of the series, in part because the writers take steps to set him up in contrast with Han. Han is, in terms of the leverage RPG, a grifter and a hitter, whereas Lando is a grifter and a mastermind. Lando certainly isn't any slouch in the fight, but he's also going to work harder to talk his way out of that fight than Han is, whereas Han is more inclined to just rip the bandit off and draw his blaster when a fight appears on the horizon, in the hopes of getting the drop on his opponent. As an aside, with the plot, Lando also once did business with a man named Captain Dribble, who ripped Lando off. Consequently, when Lando runs a con, he uses Captain Dribble as an alias, much as Sam Axe and Burn noticed, 
used Chuck Finley as an alias, but for a different reason. In particular, Lando hopes that whoever he's conned, when that Mark gets pissed, goes hunting for Captain Drebbel and finds the real one and takes him down. Also, Lando has a very impressive Captain Harlock cosplay outfit. If someone hasn't made a Captain Harlock cosplay outfit for Billy D. Williams as a, a gift, they absolutely should, and just putting it out there. While I realize it's not a full helmet cosplay thing as um, what is normally done for Adam Savage and friends at San Diego Comic Con, maybe Billy D. should do the Harlock cosplay along whatever Adam Savage does for San Diego Comic Con next year. Just a thought. It'd be cool, and it'd be a really deep-cut joke reference for people. This stretch is the effective introduction to the Mandalorians as a culture, along with the idea of the Mandalorian Super Commando. We also learned that there are only three commandos left, but of the three, Fett is in the Renegade. The other two we meet are. The ruler of Mandalore, who isn't known as Mandalore yet, threw in his lot with the Empire, with the Mandalorians serving as slave hunters for the Empire. The Super Commandos rejected this, except for Fett. Fett betrayed the other Commandos who were wiped out, save for two. When Lando gave the order to abandon Cloud City, people listened. When Lando and some rebel soldiers returned during this run, the city is abandoned to such a degree that the Empire is finding it not worth operating without anyone there to run it. The only inhabitants remaining are some Ugnots who live on the planet's surface, and who have booby-trapped the city itself to hell and back. Speaking of which, we see the Ugnots in Ugnot Society. It reminds me a lot of the hyper-capitalist parody society we see in the manga Caravan Kid in the form of the Akogi. We also see some of the inner workings of the Alliance through Luke's court-martial. Now, unlike the adaptation of Empire Strikes Back, which ran in the main Star Wars book, the adaptation of Return of the Jedi ran in its own separate book. So, consequently, we have several issues running contemporaneously with that adaptation. Those tend on the side of filler, with some narrative beats being clarified over the course of the work as far as set up for Return of the Jedi. In particular, there is a hunt over several issues for some Rebel tapes, which are later clarified to be from the Bothans. These are recovered in issue 80, L, which is a really well-written and well-drawn issue. While the first run of Marvel Star Wars was firmly anchored, tonally, in the Silver Age, this arc fits much better in the Bronze Age, which makes sense as several major Bronze Age writers, like, well, Michelin, Simonson, and Claremont, were writing for Star Wars at this time. We also get elements from these writers that will show up in their other runs. In particular, in the case of Claremont, we get a little bit of the, to borrow a expression from Jane Miles' Explain the X-Men, the angry Claremontian narrator, but perhaps a more lasting part of this, a more long-running part of this, in terms of Claremont's other work, is the introduction to various incidental characters who get some character death that is slightly tongue-in-cheek, who are set to die or be knocked out, these characters normally being Imperial officers and stormtroopers. I like to think Claremont's writing here is the inspiration for the death cries of various battle droids in the Clone Wars animated series, like, I was two weeks from retirement! And that sort of thing. My favorite stories of this run are the storyline with Sharia Bray, Ellie, and Annual Number 3, which will pay off later after Return of the Jedi, which I like to think sets up the concept of the secret Sith Apprentice that would get come more to the fore in the expanded universe after the introduction of the Rule of Two in the prequel films. Next time, Han got his own trilogy, so now it's Lando's turn with the Lando Calrissian adventures. See you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.